we're so thrilled to have you join us today for our Up Level Live session. Um, today we have Gregarious Narain, Gregarious quote Greg Narain, because um, I will be uh, uh, saying Greg from now on uh, uh, when I talk about him. And so if you're new to um, our for up level live sessions. We are doing this every Wednesday with um, speakers and thought leaders in their specific uh, area of expertise, be it career, be it entrepreneurship, um, to help you up level your life, your career, or your business. And so uh, I'm Robin Cohen. If you're new to this, I'm the co-founder of Uplevel. We are a micro learning online experience. And as I mentioned, we want to gather the best of the best uh, of, of speakers and thought leaders um, from around the country um, to help you uplevel your life, your career, or your business. And so how it works is in the chat section, feel free to chat and engage. Uh, you know, let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm tuning in from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And I know that Gregarious is in Denver, Colorado. So let us know where you are tuning in from. Uh, also, just to let you know, in the chat, feel free to chat about whatever you want. Uh, uh, you know, um, that we want to use that section so that people are engaging with each other. You will notice that there is a specific Q&A session. We hope that you can put your questions for Greg in that section so that we can separate what's happening in the chat from the Q&A session. So before we dive in, I would love to take a moment and introduce Gregarious Noreen. So I've actually known Gregarious. Gregarious, how long have I known you now for? Uh, it's gotta be like at least 12 or 13 years is probably, right? I guess. It, yeah. Yes. So I, I'm really our teenage, our teenage years, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, our teenage <laughs> years when we were young and fancy free. Uh, so I've actually known Gary's for uh, quite a long time, and uh, I'm so thrilled to have him um, as a speaker today on our Up Level Live session. And so let me give you a bit of his background. So Greg has been at the forefront of social media marketing, influencer marketing, and product marketing for more than 20 years. In his illustrious career, Greg has helped drive marketing verticals such as content management, email and customer relationship systems, and marketing research with a focus on product development and launches. Greg has been the founder of numerous startups in the influencer marketing space, as well as being the founder of his own agency that worked with startups and Fortune 500 companies on product development and business strategy. Greg brings his product experience to marketing by leveraging his experience in problem solving skills to dissect industries, define problems, and create innovative product solutions. Most recently, Greg was the CTO and co-founder of Shoot, a visual marketing platform serving the Fortune 500 that helped drive influencer engagement and brands connecting with passionate fans and customers. Prior to Shoot, Greg was the first employee and vice president of product at Clout, the startup that defined influencer marketing, for those that remember, <laughs> with its social influence platform. Greg has spoken internationally at many leading industry events, including Cannes, Lions Innovation, Dreamforce, uh, NAB, uh, South by Southwest, um, and is involved with numerous nonprofits and organizations. He holds a Bachelor of Arts from New York University in Sociology. Well, welcome. Um, like, who's that guy? I want, I want to meet. I want to meet that guy. Right. <laughs> it's like. Who, who am I talking about? Well, welcome. This is awesome. And um, usually what I like to do is just um, ask Greg a couple of questions just to kind of like open up, you know, what we're talking about here um, before I give the floor to him. So Greg, since, you know, you and I and our significant others and, you know, just our community 
community of friends that we've known for such a long time, right? Back in the, I would say, like the beginning days of Silicon Beach, <laughs> before it was right. even called Silicon Beach. Um, you know, there was just so much activity going on back then in terms of, you know, people building businesses and, you know, really starting to like embrace entrepreneurship, right? What that whole world world um, looks like. And so now here we are 12, 13, 14, 15 years later, right? Reflecting on all of this. And then I think reflecting on it more now because of just what this year, you know, has created for us. Right. And so can you tell the audience from your experience, like what has been the most rewarding part of entrepreneurship for you? Ooh, um, I think uh, that's a pretty easy question, I think, for me to answer, actually. Um, okay. So I think um, at heart, I'm, I'm a builder. Uh, and the, the entrepreneurship has provided sort of this power to see like the things in your head come to life in the real world, right? Um, yeah. I've, I've, you know, never been like that obsessed with sort of the money side of entrepreneurship. Like, you know, like I can sell, but I hate asking for money. It's just like one of those great <laughs> things. Yeah. Um, but put me, put me in front of the room to talk about like what we're making or the product. And like, that's like just where I gush. Right. And so yeah. um, that, that's why I love being an entrepreneur is that um, if I can see the things I imagine come to life, that's a really powerful construct if I can do that and then get paid to do it, that's an even better arrangement. Right. Um, and what if we I all can, hope for. <laughs> if I can put away a bit more for my family and you know, the future, then that's, that's the trifecta. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so the flip side of that is what has been the most challenging part of entrepreneurship for you? Uh, putting your ideas into the world. <laughs> probably <also. laughs> so, um, you know, the, the fundamental risk of putting what you believe or what you love into the world is that it is then also prone to ridicule, rejection, Absolutely. Um, you know, um, and, and eventually, you know, most likely, unfortunately failure. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, it is a very humbling experience to be an entrepreneur at the same time, because, um, you know, something like still like 95, 96% of startups fail, right? Yes. And so- Scary, high that, number, but yes. To the extent you're going to put yourself out there, uh, you're also usually putting yourself out there to ultimately fail. Maybe, you know, there are, um, you know, moral victories and there are other kinds of wins in the process. Uh, but but uh, if purely from a business point of view, you know, most of the time they don't, it doesn't usually work out. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I'm actually reading the classic Bible of entrepreneurship, Lean Startup, right now. And for those of you out there, if you're interested, you know, and you're dabbling or thinking of dabbling in entrepreneurship, that is the book to read. <laughs> um, that just really gives you probably the greatest insight. You know, I mean, Eric Ries is what, when he started talking about, you know, minimum Bible product and all that kind of stuff and I think that you know maybe behind closed doors depending upon who those circles of entrepreneurs were they knew that terminology but I think like that book really helped to you know really put it out into to the public and probably encourage other people to to become entrepreneurs um you know I know that um our audience, I know that some of them um, are, you know, they have careers, right, in, you know, working with different companies. But I also know a lot of them also have either lost their job or, you know, they've been furloughed or, you know, they're, they're thinking about what their next move is, right? And so in talking about um, entrepreneurship and taking that leap of faith, what is your advice for them, Greg, right? Like, and, and I think that what I, how I would like to define this is, is that, you know, even if you're starting like a small business, right? Like that is entrepreneurship, you know? So when we think of like the neighborhood salon, you know, or the neighborhood restaurant, um, you know, obviously we know that these tech companies, you know, they started startups and they can like grow to be behemoth companies, right? Like 
Facebook, for example. I mean, yeah. lack of like a better example right now since, you know, they're, they're getting a bad rap. But still, I mean, they are a classic story, right? But I think people need to understand that no matter what type of business you're starting, you are essentially becoming an entrepreneur. So what is your advice for people that are um, contemplating that right now? Uh, it's a, it'll, we'll dive a lot into this, I guess, into, into the talk as well today. Cause I, I used the metaphor of you, your life as a startup. Um, but I, I would say where I see most people sort of stumble is actually at the earliest parts of the process, right? Um, which is that they, they, they think it's something for someone else, right? Like they don't imagine that they could do it. Um, and that's part of like why like a book like Eric Reese's book is really good or lead startup, right? And, and almost any framework is it gives you some place to start as opposed to not knowing yeah. where to start, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, my guess is that most entrepreneurs would do well to try. Um, and I think, uh, you know, where, where they, where I would say ultimately the number one problem, and I think this is what lead startup is a lot about, is that. Um, you don't understand the customer well enough, right? And so, you know, I, I always tell people entrepreneurs are fundamentally, you know, uh, optimists, but, you know, they are also yeah. like perpetual pessimists, right? Um, and so, um, and, and the reality, I think, is that um, you've got to remember that as an entrepreneur, once you decide to commit to doing something as a business or for business or for profit, you are no longer the user, Right. Um, right. And so, it, and to that extent, <clears throat> um, and my friend Lindsay Tate is, uh, that's her, one of her quotes and I, I love it. I always use it. But to the extent that that's true, what it means is that what you understand about the value you're creating, like has to go beyond your experience, right? It has to like now right. become the experience of your customers more so than it is like, well, I, I have this problem. So, well, that's great. You can solve that problem for yourself. A, that a business that does not make right yes um, great point and so and so that's where most people i think screw up is that um you know everyone hears this kind of, kind of trope of like solve a real pain a problem that you're having well that's cool but that doesn't make it a business right like you need to make sure that there's enough people with that problem right and that that problem is yes. um is discreet enough and pain and acute enough that they're willing to pay money ultimately to alleviate it, right yes Exactly. And that's a great point. And that's actually the part that I'm reading right now is like, you know, you might think that like, hey, this is a great business idea. You know, you just launch it and you're like, yeah, people are just going to, you know, come and check it out or buy it and whatnot. But, um, but but it's, it's, it's not like that. It's kind of like, you have to kind of gauge a little bit of both survey your customers, get to know your customers and all that. And like, yeah, if you don't have a customer base, you definitely don't have a business. <laughs> yeah, that's right. so yeah and so um so greg's talk today is about a system for surviving work startups and life and he's going to get to that in just a moment but just a reminder that we want you to engage in chat we definitely want you to to ask questions we are going to do the audience q a after um his talk and remember at the end of that we are going to be announcing the winner of getting a private mentor session with greg and even vip access to his new platform so yes. just keep that in mind so if you really are serious about launching into entrepreneurship you get to have a chance to have it a mentorship session with Greg. So again, we want you to really engage in the session. Definitely put your questions in Q&A. And without further ado, Greg, I'm going to pass the mic and the floor, uh, you know, to you and you right. have at it. I will see let's you see guys if, in a bit. Let's see if we don't break this again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Share. Let me know if it's showing the right thing. Yep, I see it. You see? Okay, great. And I'm going to pull that. Okay. Do you see just my slide, the main slide? Yep, I see it. Yeah, okay. All right. Good. <laughs> so uh, thanks, everyone, for taking some time today to be here with us. Um, 
I'm going to share with you, I've been an entrepreneur, you know, for as long as I can imagine, probably since like the, you know, I was like 10 years old, I was figuring out ways to sell things and create things. Um, and I've learned a lot of lessons um, the hard way. Uh, you know, I like to say that I've blown millions of dollars uh, in the process and uh, of learning the lessons I know now. And ultimately, I think, um, I think that a startup is a really great metaphor for life itself. And so this talk is kind of about entrepreneurship, but it's really about entrepreneurship of yourself as well as entrepreneurship potentially in your career or at the company maybe you want to start, whatever it may be. Um, so, uh, you know, the title of this talk is that life is a startup and you're the product. And I think this is a really important distinction um, for you to understand. Um, now, I'm just going to, oh, did that work? Okay, go back. Did the keyboard work? No. Ah. There we go. And just a little bit about me because I want you to understand, I guess, the breadth and the way I see myself. Um, first, you know, obviously, like I said, I've been an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I've done about 14 different companies in the last 25 years or so. Uh, most of them are bootstrapped. So I basically was working on my own to fund my own projects. The last couple I worked at uh, were venture back where we raised money from outside investors. I'm also a husband. Uh, for 10 years this November, and I'm a proud father of a five-year-old, uh, Solomon. Uh, also, last year, at the age of 44, I decided that I was going to become a bodybuilder, um, and so I've been spending my time like doing the intense training that's required about that. And the reason I mention these things is that I think it's really important to understand that whenever you take one pursuit on, you're never really taking one pursuit on, you're really still part of an ecosystem. And so when I think about that from the lens of like a startup, you know, startups have stakeholders. They, um, they have sort of people that they are responsible to, right? Now, if you're a founder, you know, maybe you've got investors, you know, if you're a business, you've got employees. If you're in a larger company, maybe you have teammates, you know, ideally as a startup, you've got your own customers out there as well, right? Um, and then, of course, you still have your family and your friends and your acquaintances. And these are all the people that we are ultimately responsible to. And so one of the things that I see often that happens is that when we decide to become or that we want to pursue a pathway is we don't always necessarily think about who all of these stakeholders are and what matters. Right. And what ends up happening, unfortunately, is that um, over time, um, these people get neglected in one way or another, right? Now, uh, I think and as Robin shared in the original post, I wrote a, a post about this uh, four, three years ago called um, A System for Surviving Startups Life and Work, and it was called the four Fs. Um, and I think that what happens is when you have these different stakeholders, you're the CEO of your startup, you're the CEO of your life, you, you're kind of managing expectations for everybody around you and everyone's going to have different kinds of demands, right? And what ends up happening, of course, is that we end up making sacrifices, right? Um, now, unfortunately, as a, as, a, as a founder or anyone who just becomes really engaged in something, one of these things will ultimately tend to take over for all of the others, right? So here I'm showing function. This, you can replace that with being a founder. But the reality is that of all the balls we're juggling, we're dealing with our finances, we're dealing with our family, we're dealing with our friends, we're dealing with our health and fitness, we're dealing with our, our faith, our religion, right? And of course we're dealing with what life is, should be hopefully about as well is the fun and the entertainment and all the other connected pieces of it that go together. And what happens too often in life is that we overemphasize one of them, right? We can become very career focused and we spend all of our time focused on work at the neglect of everything else. We become founder focused and we, and we spend all of our time thinking about our startup and we, we literally forget and stop thinking about everything else, right? And I think that that's highly problematic, but it's inevitable, right? Like, um, and what I've, you know, guided people around here is that ultimately when you're, as you in, and take on a new pursuit is to sort of be honest with the people and each of these other pillars about it, right? So Robin asked a great question at the beginning, like, what do you see or how is it, what's it take to start a startup? Well, I was like, well, you gotta be honest with yourself. Do I have 
the financial wherewithal to go down this pathway. If I want to switch careers, you know, I, I've just turned 40, I just turned 50, I, like, or I just decided, you know, I have a college degree in this and I want to do this. Do I have the financial wherewithal to hold out to become good or become a winner in the new thing that I want to do, right? Do I have the support of my family and friends, right? Do I understand the time it's going to take? And ultimately, am I okay with potentially neglecting these people in the pursuit of that? Am I in a state where I can ignore my, my health, right? Um, am I going to let my faith slip? Am I willing to sacrifice fun? Right now, I'm not saying that you need to sacrifice these things. Ultimately, by the end of this talk, I hope you'll find that you don't have to. <clears throat> but what we do know that does happen inevitably is that one way or another, we, stand, we tend to put more and more time into one of these things. Now, that doesn't stay permanent, right? But it is inevitable, right? And what I believe that is important to be successful is honesty, right? If you decide you want to start a company and you've got the finances to do it, right? Or you want to go on a new career path, right? And you got the ability to fund it. You got to still also go and be clear with your family and your friends that that's the thing you're going to do. And you have to be clear about what you anticipate. You won't know the answer as you're starting for what it really takes. But what you can be upfront is honest about the fact that you are going to spend more and more of your time on it. Right. And so I think what happens is when people are dishonest about how much time something is going to take or they try to take for granted or uh, right, what ends up happening is they neglect and ultimately potentially lose these other things from their life. And that's the situation that I think we ultimately wanna figure out how to avoid. So startups have stakeholders, you have stakeholders. There are many people who are the consumers of your product and you have to pay care and attention to all of them. And they are not necessarily just people. Remember like if your health fails and you can't continue to pursue this line of uh, work or whatever it may be that you're doing, then that doesn't help you either. If you run out of money, that doesn't help you, right? If your friends and family disown you and there's no one left at the end for you to share in the success of it, that doesn't help you, right? So just remember all of these stakeholders are real, even though it may seem like we don't have to address them or run towards them or we can neglect them. The reality is we need to be careful with that. Now, the second thing about startups as it relates to life as well, is that ultimately startups have constraints, right? All of us have constraints. None of us, I don't think, is really blessed with unlimited resources and access um, and ideas, right? And so this very simple framework here that you see is that I believe that all startups are powered by these three simple things, right? It's a commitment to do something. It's a number of choices in support of that commitment and ultimately is a recognition and um, a reconciliation of the costs required to do that, right? And these things are virtuous, right? And they service each other. And sometimes the choices have new kinds of costs and it goes back and forth. But when you decide to pursue anything in life, just remember and be honest about the constraints that actually exist, right? Because we are not doing things in a vacuum. We're doing things on the clock with everyone watching, right? And we need to be honest and careful about how we do that. And that's what I was saying earlier about being clear about the commitments you're making. I'm committed to doing 20 hours per week on this side project. I'm committed to spending 15 hours a week or nights and weekends to learn this new skill so I can switch careers. I'm committed to the next 10 years. By the way, if you're gonna go do an actual startup, most of the time you probably have to think in a 10 year timeline, not a one or two year timeline, right? That's how long it takes to be successful uh, with the business. Now. You can see commitments, we talked about that, right? Your stakeholders, they're really the people you're making commitments to. The next part really is about the, the choices that we're gonna make. And I came up with um, a really simple framework uh, that um, I think has been very effective and I use it for myself all the time. Um, and the best way I can, I, the way I describe it is best words last, right? Because too often um, when we get placed in a situation where it's time to make a decision, right? You know, I've, I've spoken to the people who I've made a commitment to. I'm about to go down this pathway. Now I have to start making choices, right? Well, we screw ourselves in a couple of ways, ultimately, when we're trying to make decisions, right? Um, because what ends up happening most of the time is that, you know, as decision makers, we leverage what we know. But with what we know comes all of our optimism and all of our pessimism at the same time, right? And now, depending on your personality, 
right? You will lean one way or the other, right? Like for me, I'm probably more optimistic. I try to see the good in things. If it was my wife, she's probably more cautious and a bit more pessimistic about which pathway, uh, what, what a thing represents. And so I give you this very simple framework to think about when you ask questions yourself, right? Or when you have come to a place where you're going to make a choice. And I think it really reflects in sort of two dimensions, right? The first one is the one I call that vertical axis there, what I call experience, right? And so when I say last, what I'm saying is experience is powerful. And what you need to do is understand the last case or the last time you did something, right? So let me give you an example. Let's say, um, you know, your boss calls you up and they're like, I need you to get this thing done by, you know, by next weekend uh, or by Monday morning, uh, et cetera, right? And so what you know with experience now, right, is what happens if you don't do that job? What happens if you do do that job? And how well do you have to do that job to satisfy that requirement, right? So in a startup world, let's say you might get an opportunity like, oh, well, I, if you want to close this deal, you've got to get this done. And what, what you say from experience is that, well, the last time we did this, I was able, I, you know, I got the work done, but our, our, the customer ended up not really needing it in the time that they said, or we didn't end up winning the deal just because we did put in this effort, or I don't really feel like I have a relationship with this person that this is a reasonable demand. But what I do know happened when I did cracked the whip on my team, forced everybody to work over the weekend, was that everyone was super pissed at me. We broke a bunch of obligations that we had maybe to our friends and family, right? And it took us a week to recover, right? Because everyone was so exhausted and burnt out from killing themselves to try and do something like that, right? And so the idea of using your last time, like ultimately, AKA your experience is really, really powerful. And so what I encourage you to do is imagine the best case scenario and the worst case scenario, and then center yourself inside of there, right? Because it's not going to be one or the other, really. This is this whole exercise framework is about, is about moderation and tempering sort of your expectations ultimately, right? This part of it, right? So leverage your experience to understand what you really do need to do, right? Now, the second, um, experience or sort of uh, vector here um, along the x-axis, right, is really about what I call legacy, right? Um, and the question for here, I think, is like, is this the last, is this the way I want to be remembered? Because I feel like this is a really important thing that a lot of people actually um, are, are thinking about often, right? So um, I'll give you an example from the sales realm. And so some, I saw someone ask, you know, how does this system help you? This is literally a, a good example. We had a, a customer looking, they needed a, um, you know, we got a lead in, like someone needed a deal. Um, they wanted us to send a proposal over by the weekend, or they want, actually it was more like, can we prove that something was possible? So it was like, were we willing to prototype it over the weekend to get it done, right? Now, experience told us that most often someone seeing this thing is gonna be there, right? But legacy, right, is the way that we wanna be remembered, right? And so like, the question becomes like, for example, if you're a salesperson sending out an email and you're now saying, what if this was the last email I ever sent to this customer? Is this the way I want them to remember me, right? Am I rash? Was I flippant? Was I angry in the response, right? Was I uh, complete and uh, thoughtful, right? Did I answer all the questions that maybe they asked, right? And you can see that if you imagine that you don't have more at bats, right? AKA, this is the last time ever, right? That you're ever gonna say, have an interaction, have a chance to, to, to win. This is the last hundred dollars you have to spend in your company. Is this the best way that you should spend it? That's what we, I'm encouraging you to also imagine, right? Because what ends up happening is when you apply these two things together, one of them is meant to constrain. Right? Your experience is meant to constrain sort of the opportunity itself and sort of like limit you to like not imagining too broadly. But the legacy part is really important in that it also gives you the chance to imagine greater, right? And it says, what else could we be in the process of doing this, right? 
And so as you start to see this, when you start to get to new decisions that you want to make, if you start to be able to imagine what does experience tell me, but then don't limit myself only by experience, but imagine what's the worst case scenario and what's the best case scenario, right? Because what we do as humans is automatically jump to best case, worst case scenario and freak ourselves out, right? And this is just a moment of pause to give you a chance to think about that, think through those things, and sort of give you two dimensions that probably matter most, right? Legacy is not about dying. It's about what if I don't have another chance, right? Don't plan for a makeup. Don't plan for a do-over. Don't plan for another phone call. If this is the thing you're sending, is it the level required to be successful, right? And think about what's going to happen if you don't do those things, right? Because that's also equally likely in the process. So that's my simple framework that I use ultimately for when I try to make decisions is I, you know, as opposed to being just purely optimistic, I try to bring them down to reality. I was like, so what happens if I don't do this or if I do this? What's happened in the past when I do this or don't do that? What's happened with this customer in the past? What's happened with my wife? What's happened with my son? What's happened with any, any relationship, any decision I'm making? These are important tools and a simple framework for trying to make some of those decisions. Happy to take some more questions on that later, by the way. Um, now, that's the choices part, right? Like we said, you make commitments to your stakeholders, you have choices, right, that you ultimately make every day, right? And then ultimately, what I was talking about earlier, that last piece is really about the costs, right? Now, the, the costs here, I think, a lot of people take for granted how expensive things are. And usually, especially like in, um, in business environments or startup environments, right? Like it tends to only be measured in finances, right? Um, I believe that that is a very foolhardy way to think about um, any pursuit anymore, right? And I will tell you from my lifetime of being an entrepreneur, I made all the mistakes, ignored everybody, um, spent most of my time heads down, just working, working, working. And I will tell you that did not make me any happier or any richer in the price, in the process itself. Right. So when we look at the costs of doing something, what I encourage you to really do is think about the debts that are being created. Right. So you remember that example of like having to work over the weekend. Well, now I don't take my son to the zoo or I put more of a burden on my wife. Right. Or, you know, um, I don't get the time to actually focus on my health or exercise. I don't even get the time to sleep anymore. Right. These are all different kinds of debt that are inherently created. And this is the nature of having stakeholders, right? Is that when you borrow time, money, energy from one of those stakeholders, you create debt. And those debts surface in different ways for different kinds of people, right? So between your friends and family, you're obviously potentially creating relationship debt by ignoring them, neglecting them, right? Or maybe even taking advantage of them, right? You may be also for your family creating financial debt. Your business may be creating financial right? You are, I guarantee you, likely wearing your body down, right? Like it's not sleeping enough, eating poorly, right? Um, not getting enough uh, exercise, right? Like these are all the physical manifestations and health manifestations of like the work we choose to do and the way we choose to do it. And then of course, there's a spiritual debt, right? And I will tell you that oftentimes I see people meet people. And when I look back at them, they're like, I'm making decisions now that I couldn't have imagined myself making before, right? And their own morality, their own spirituality is often drained as well in the process of pursuing a goal, you know, with too much vigor uh, and too many blinders on to like what else is going on in the world, right? And often this is the thing that I see wear people down even more so is the guilt or the frustration or the anger at themselves for the things that they're having to do to try to succeed or to try and win, right? So to the extent that your life is a startup, the extent that you are the product, remember that it is powered by things and every day we are spending against our future, right? Um, and so each of those things is creating different kinds of debt. And I think each of those debts needs to be given proper airtime, proper coverage, and actually looked upon so people can understand upfront what those debts are. Now, here's why I tell people, look at these things upfront so you understand them, 
Because if you cannot have these kinds of conversations with yourself and your stakeholders before you start, it only gets harder the more committed you feel to that thing over time. And remember, this thing doesn't have to be a startup. It's your life. It's whatever pursuit it is that you are going after. If that's your happiness, whatever you view that as, however that's going to manifest, it's whatever you view as success and your legacy ultimately, it's whatever you view, if you have children, they are to become, right? All of these things are the same thing ultimately. Now, I don't want to be a downer here. So I want to give you four tips on how to actually do this or survive this, right? And how to figure out how to rebalance that seesaw, right? And, you know, honestly, <clears throat> the biggest and best tip I can give you is that you've got to minimize the guilt in the process, right? Um, oh, I had a slide here, I swear. I took it out. There's something. Oh, my, my thing crashed. That was one. Uh, sorry. So, but the idea is that you should minimize the amount of guilt you feel. Now, I'm not telling you to be guilt free. I guess what I am saying is you should acknowledge that because of the choices you made, that certain things are going to happen. And because you're now being cognizant of the choices you're making, you will feel guilty. Now, your job is to move to alleviate that guilt. But remember, you've also committed or create, if you do this the right way, you create the space and the room for you to try and succeed. And it gives you a little bit of buffer on that guilt, right? So here's the thing. I feel like most people overwhelm themselves with guilt <clears throat> and that's because they don't acknowledge the choices they've made, right? And that's because they weren't honest with the people who they needed to be honest with. And so if you do that up front, what you do is you actually help eliminate some of the guilt that comes from actually just doing these things without asking for permission, right? So up front. I don't think you, you're not going to live a guilt-free life, but I want you to be honest so that you can minimize the guilt itself. The second thing, you can't do all of the things at the same time, right? Like I feel like everyone tries to do this. And so what's really important is to actually just try to get good at one, right? Whatever that thing is, set the time aside so that you can focus on it and give it its fair chance. Because if not, you will always be looking over and feeling bad about it, right? So my recommendation is be good at one thing first, then figure out how to be good at the second thing, then learn how to be good at more things, right? So I like using the analogy of juggling, right? Like when you learn how to juggle, you juggle one ball first. You just learn how to throw one ball up in the air. You don't start with chainsaws and five of them at the same time, right? So if you're having trouble trying to rebalance your life from like a, a work-centric or pure work or overindulgent work lifestyle, First, figure out how to create the system there so you can do that work efficiently, right? Then you start to bring in and mix in getting good at other things. And that small process of learning how to do one thing, then another thing, then a third thing is how you get there. It's baby steps, right? And it gives you the opportunity to measure and move forward little by little. Now, the other thing, this is a hack, right? But I believe there are ways to mix things up, right? Um, so, you know, for example, if you don't have time for fitness, but you do a lot of phone calls, walk while you do your calls, right? And it's this blending of these different forces or these different things, right? Finding ways to save money that also it makes you eat healthier. Like, great, I don't buy a McDonald's or Chipotle for lunch every day. I bring my lunch, I save money. I'm making better things for me. You can see how by touching, you can touch on more than one of these things little by little, right? Um, if you've got a spouse and you're pursuing a startup or some idea like that, do not leave your spouse out of what you're doing. That's just incredibly not like, that's not going to work to your advantage. We all think that, well, I'm doing this and my wife or my husband or partner doesn't care about these things. They care because you care, right? They want to know what you're doing. And oftentimes they have great advice because they are not stuck in it the same way that you are, right? So by mixing by blending, I'm not saying you should like blend your work life into your home life, but I'm saying don't take for granted that there could be value in that, right? You know, sometimes let's say you have to do a lot of work events, but you know, hey, they're kind of open or they're industry, invite your friends out, let them come and grab some free drinks. Well, at some point we'll be able to buy anything. Um, but finding ways to cross these things and bring these things together and also being honest that I'm just not gonna have the ability to go out and drink with my friends for six hours on the evening. So I got to do more family friendly things and I'm going to spend more time with my friends who are cool, my family or that my family's cool with, as opposed to like maybe my other friends that I only hang out with alone. 
These are just the sacrifices that we know come with it, and it's up to us to optimize and build towards that path. And then lastly, and most importantly, mistakes happen. You are going to screw up. Everyone screws up. It is the way things go. Startups iterate. That is what we will be doing in our lives forever. So as you make mistakes, just make sure that you use an opportunity to learn from it, not to actually just constantly repeat it. So talk for a while. Uh, I'm happy to take some questions now. And uh, I hope this was helpful, you know, in the form we've gone through so far. That was awesome. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, even things that I need to think about <laughs> as well. Um, and so I definitely have some questions. So let me just pull those up for you. Cool. Okay. So I know that you mentioned, because you saw one of the questions was, you know, how's the system help you? And I'd love to kind of expand on that more because when you originally wrote the article, it was back in 2017, right? And so yeah. um, I, I would love to know first, you know, what made you like take a step back and be like, wait, I have to actually maybe create a system for myself to yeah. make sure that I'm surviving, you know, my life. And then once you kind of created it, right? Um, and just even thinking all these years since then, but especially now, how has that system helped you? Yeah, so the origin or genesis, I mean, obviously is I think my whole career, but I think where it really came to a head was at my last company, um, you know, my son was born in 2017. That was probably year five of our, our company. We had offices. I was like, um, you know, in, on the sales side. So I was like, vis I had to visit every one of our offices every quarter. You know, I was flying about 150, 180,000 miles a year. Um, and my wife was just home with our newborn, right? Like, I think like the first day, like three days after he was born, I went back to the office, right? And, wow. yeah. you know, um, and here's the thing i learned this the hard way hence i share it with you now she right. wasn't mad that i had to to work she was mad or upset that i didn't bother to even check with her and 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 the force that was on the other side for me was that i felt like this company was also my child and it was so important like i needed to be there for it to be successful right and that, that draw put me in this inevitable place where I felt I had no power but to do yeah. the work, right? Like, because I had still have to provide for this little baby that basically sleeps all day. And so, like, I could just round it off, right, that, that my wife's got it, right? Not yeah. understanding all the emotions she was going through, everything she was feeling, right? And so I felt powerless or succumbed to my own business, right? Like I let my startup be this thing that defined my life, right? Mm -hmm. um, even more so than like the most important thing in my life that had just been born, right? Right. And so that that was like that wake up call for me where I started to see that, wow, this is like really crappy and I'm a crappy person for doing it. But I started to say like, I get I'm a crappy person for doing it, but I don't understand why I did it. And so that's when I started to try to like, you know, do the introspection to find out like what was going wrong. Right. Um, yes. And that's when I realized that like the original four apps were really friends, you know, founder as in like your, your function, you know, family, uh, friends and fun. Right. Like it's very simple. And, and I was just like, look, these are the four things you kind of need in life. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and then I expanded that to those other things because as I talked to more people and looked more importantly in, inwards, that's when I found, I was like, well, actually I left out like money, like duh, right? Like, or I left my, I left my health out, right? Like, or, you know, what yeah. about your faith and your spirituality, right? Like whatever you are, like, I'm not, I'm not a religious person, but I still believe in things, right? Like, yes. um, and so like, as I started to see it, I was like, those four things weren't enough there was a lot of considerations in terms of like what matters to people. Right. And each yeah. of them had a consumer, including myself. Right. And so that's when I started to realize that, that I was not looking at and leveraging the skills I had at running a company or defining and building products. 
I was like, I could apply that model to me a little bit better. And that's how I started to like, to sort of stumble down this pathway. Yeah, I think it's great because, you know, work-life balance, work-life integration, work-life harmony, yeah. you know, all these new terms or just different terms that we're trying to define these things by um, have gotten a little bit tired, right? And so yeah. I just like the fact that you're like, let's create a system, you know, where um, you create that system based on those different aspects of your work and your life and, or your business, whatever it looks like, and find what makes sense for you to be able yeah. to manage everything. And that's why I love it so much. Um, I'm gonna move into on to another question. This comes sure. from Laura. Um, Laura asked, what is the hardest lesson you have learned along the way? Yeah, um, I would say it's to forgive yourself, right? Okay. Because, I like that. Um, you know, it, we, we beat ourselves up, right? Like we feel bad, right? And then on top of that, you know, you may also have someone's boot on your throat because you did that, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, that doesn't help, right? So you, you sort of like want to avoid the hot stove, right? Like whenever you can. But what I found was the more painful part was the lingering part. It was not the daggers when people were mad at me. It was the resentment I felt about myself for being that way or for feeling powerless to actually change it, right? Yes. Um, and that, that, like, the first step of that was, like, being able to forgive myself that knowing I made a mistake and that, okay, what am I going to do about it is all that matters. Or is it matters more now that I've already made the mistake, right? Yes. even less so than how I got to making a mistake, right? Because like when you go to look for how you got to making a mistake, too often that's really trying to find an excuse for why it happened, right? As opposed to like yes. trying to find a reason or a way to take ownership for what happened, right? Um, so really for me, it's about the proactive part about how do I reconcile that going forward as opposed to sort of like, how do I go back and reconstruct or justify or do whatever, you know, other nonsense you, you might try to do. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. This next question comes in from Karen. So Karen asks, when you're evaluating the things that you're sacrificing, how do you accurately estimate the gravity of each individual or, you know, each thing, uh, each, mm -hmm. sorry, each individual sacrifice? So for example, how do you make sure you're not underestimating the sacrifices so that you can keep commitments to family, faith, health, et cetera? That's a great question. So great question, Karen. So number one, you're going to underestimate. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's just be, like I said, be honest with yourself, right? Um, here's what I would say, right? And it goes really back to the framework, right? It, be, by having those stakeholder interviews early and talking to the people, right? And by the way, this is not a one-time thing. Right. So when you get investors, you don't talk to them once when they give you your money and then you never hear from them again. Right. <laughs> so you have to constantly reevaluate. Right. So I think like this is not a static thing. Right. Like, so you've got to do it. Um, you, you, you have an initial conversation. You say, well, can we try this? Right. And you come to a consensus or an agreement about what you guys, what you as two parties are sort of agreeing to. Right. Like, so for if you're going to start a company, and you go to your spouse and you're like, well, so I really want to start this company. They're going to lay down a whole bunch of law. Like they're going to be like, look, you can do that, but you're not allowed to lose any of our money or you still have, you still have, you know, um, babysitting and you still have like whatever duties with the family and your other chores still apply. Right. Um, or they may be like, you know what? You helped me get through X. I'm going to try to help you get through Y. I got all this stuff you go focus on that thing, right? There's not a right or wrong answer either. So don't feel like someone's betraying you or screwing you over when these other things are there, right? But what you have to do is have that conversation with each stakeholder, right? And now remember, not every stakeholder is as important, right? Like you've got a lot of family, right? Exactly. Right? But that doesn't mean like, you know, your third cousin who you don't really talk to doesn't get the same <laughs> amount of waiting in the system as like say your partner or maybe your parent, if you take care of them or whatever it may be, right? So I think part, part one is you're gonna under, underestimate wrong. Number two is have the talks to understand because the problem that you're gonna have is if you're assuming what is enough for that other person, right? 
And in the business world, we come up with KPIs and then we measure our success and track towards them. Do the same thing for this stuff, right? Uh, now that could be as yes. simple, right? It could be as simple as once a week, sitting down with your partner and saying, so how did, how are we doing this week? How did you feel? I know like, you know, like we've been saying, you know, I know we've been saying like, this was enough time. Is it enough? Right? Like, do you feel okay? Do you feel happy? Do you feel neglected? Do you feel, you know, excited about what I'm doing, whatever it may be, but, but do your, your direct, you know, your, your one-on-ones with your stakeholders and still understand how things are going and those spot checks along the way. Right now, the last part you asked was like, um, and, uh, accurate estimate, you're not going to do that. Um, right. The gravity of each, you got to have a weighting system. So it's going to depend on what matters to you the most. Right. Um, yeah. and here's the thing, like I said, everything is in motion. Right. And so what you want to avoid, I believe is wild swings, right? Because if you're doing a wild swing, then you probably effed up. Right. So if you're like, I can't work on this for a week now because my, my partner's totally pissed at me, you've screwed up already. Like now you know you've actually already gone too far, right? Because yeah. what happened is you weren't paying enough attention along the way, right? And what happened is you got to that boiling point, right? And it's, as we all know, if you have long, or you have steady and frequent conversations, you start to understand what's going on as opposed to being surprised by things. So if you're surprised by things, it means your system's not working for you well enough. And you either need to have more conversations or you need to have more frequent updates to the process because it's too unpredictable, right? Like the thing yeah. changes too much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this question comes in from Todd. So in your opinion, what are two to three industries or areas that are good for starting a company now? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, LinkedIn just put up like their top 50, you know, startups for 2020. This is like their fourth annual yeah. list. And it's very interesting, you know, what industries or categories, you know, these companies are doing well in. Um, so yeah, on, based on, you know, your experience, your opinion, where, where do you see those yeah. industries or areas? So I think it depends on your, what kind of company you want to make. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you three examples of three different things. Um, one, uh, so I do a lot of work with influencers and creators. And I believe like this entrepreneur, this is the next generation of founders and entrepreneurs, right? People totally. who are creating, um, you know, online content, like we're doing even today, right? Education, yeah. entertainment, et cetera, right? Now, why do I believe this? It's not just because I like it. It's because I believe like the AI killers will be coming and what they will do is they will eliminate a significant amount of work that a lot of people do today and what's going to be yeah. left and what's still valuable and important is that the way people learn and the way people are entertained is a finely tuned thing each of us has different appetites and the great thing about the wide array of people who can create and offer value in the world is we can fine tune and find just the person who explains science exactly the way that i like to learn it and that's always an opportunity that's going to be out there. And if you can find one, you can probably find a thousand or 10,000, right? Yeah. At a more industrial level, I'm really amazed at like sort of the food chain, like after seeing what happened with COVID, um, I think it's really interesting what has happened that like, what, I, one of the things that really excited, I was really compelled or excited, interested about was that like, we have these commercial food chains and we have these retail food chains. Mm -hmm. or consumer food chains and they don't work together and right. so you would hear all these stories about all this food just getting trashed because the restaurants weren't buying it yet we have people starving and dying in the world right like and looking for food and so i feel like things that deal with like those kinds of disconnects where there's increased consumerization of processes um, or the commercialization of things is moving out of big industry into smaller and smaller industry. I think like there's yeah. interesting opportunities in that arena. Um, yeah. And I, I'm also a big fan of direct to consumer stuff. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, a lot of people got like small products ideas are in them and, um, and they are solving a problem for a small audience, but I think small businesses that supplement your income is a great place to be. Right. So I think all those little hobbies you have, 
where you know a whole set of people and you can provide tools to support them. You can provide services to support them. I love that. I love all those things. I don't care what it is, you know, making, you know, flies for fishing or handbags. I just saw an article today about some woman. It was like, you're, you're an idiot starting a handbag company now. And she sold 365 handbags that look like fruit, um, you know, while COVID's going on, right? Like, so, you know, like find your passion, like find a way to pour yourself into something. And then if you can monetize it, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I completely, completely agree. And yes, the whole influencer, you know, creator space, just um, what I've been seeing on from Instagram to YouTube to Patreon in between, like how people are leveraging those platforms right now because of COVID, but just, I think in general, I think that that's definitely a really fascinating space. Uh, next question. So what is the one mistake you think that most entrepreneurs make? We sort of, we touched on this before um, at, yeah. at the beginning part. And I think like, Probably not understanding the market or talking to enough customers. Um, mm -hmm. I have so many mistakes entrepreneurs make, though. Um, <laughs> I, the other part, I think, another big one that they made, just to add to that list, is is working from the success state backwards, right? So mm -hmm. they imagine what the optimal, most successful version, un, unimpaired by the reality of reality right? looks like. And so they optimize for too many things, right? They get a lease for too long. They pay too much rent. Um, they order too much inventory. Um, they pay too much. They, they build features before they're needed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But like that over optimization around the success state, I think is another place that people fundamentally fail, right? I saw yeah. um, Marissa mentioned, yeah, don't quit your job, right? Like the day after you incorporate your side hustle, right? Like that's just more on it, right? Like grow into it, like let the success state become reality, then do it, right? But I think what happens is we, 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 we get optimistic, right? Like we get one customer and we think that, you know, a point is a pattern and it's not, right? Um, yeah. That's yeah. not how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then in the, the chat section, so there's actually one more question that I want to get to. Sure. Um, it comes from Laura again, and she asks, how much time each week do you spend on social media promoting yourself, your brand? You know, are you self-taught in doing this or did you learn how to promote on your own? And yeah, I mean, I think like for anyone that's watched The Social Dilemma <laughs> on Netflix, you know, uh, it definitely gives you something to think about in terms of, you know, how we're using social media, how it's affecting people. But honestly, at the end of the day, and this is what I've told uh, a couple of people based on that documentary, is it still such a great, effective way to market yourself, your brand right now, not a lot of cost up front, right? So, um, yeah, how, how would you answer that? So, uh, to, all right, let me answer that question first. I, uh, I'm self-taught as well. Um, and yeah, I, I have like no like formal education in any of the things I do, right? So it's like all hands-on experience. You learn it the hard and stupid way, um, yeah. ultimately. And uh, you experiment and you try things. Um, now, I will say one of the problems that social media does have right now is there is a bit, I, uh, I've been reading this book called The Instagram Iceberg. And it's actually like this, it's a great book because it's actually, it points out there's this sort of like um, legend about how social media works that doesn't actually marry to the reality anymore, right? Like that um, about like everyone thinks now all you need to do is like make a product, buy some ads on Instagram and boom, you're done. Well, that's actually not how it works really, right? Um, it's gotten a lot harder to stand out on social. Like in the early days when we were starting, yeah, it was like literally like all of our friends were the people on social media. Uh, and then now there's billions of people on it. And so standing out is not easy like it used to be, right? Um, we hear the success stories, but those success stories are old, right? Um, and so when you like actually update that knowledge and talk to people who are doing it today, it takes a lot more money. You get a lot smaller return on it. Right. So don't just don't be convinced too easily or readily that it's just going to happen 
just because social's out there, right? Yeah. Um, like the followerships that we have, our, our audiences that we have now, you know, <clears throat> Robin and I have been doing this for 12, 13 years. Yeah, like we have decent sized followings, but that's because we've been doing it for 12, 13 years, right? <laughs> um, you know, you, when you need a following, a community, an audience, you gotta start way, way in advance, right? So this is another why, reason why when you wanna start a business, if you can't name where your customers are, then you don't have customers, right? Yeah. So if you cannot describe how to reach them, then you don't have a customer base, right? Because like, yeah. it's just, it, 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 it's a non-existent thing. Like you could be like, well, lots of people have this problem. Well, where are those lots of people? How do you talk <laughs> yeah. to them, right? Like if you cannot talk to them in a scalable way, you do not have a scalable business, right? Like it's just a yeah. simple truth, right? Um, I did want to go back though. Karen, at the last part of Karen's question, now I remember what she was asking, is how do you find the time? Use a calendar, okay? Like it seems crazy and simple and stupid, but put things on the calendar, time box things, so you actually do them, right? Yeah. And then yep. focus only on that thing in that time, right? Like I get up at 4 a.m. every morning so I can go to the gym and be home by seven to like, well, I get before so I can work for an hour and a half, then go to the gym for an hour and a half, and be home to get my son ready to drop him to school for 7.55 so that I could then be back to the office site for 8.30, right? Like, so right. that is the kind of discipline it has to have, and that's how the time has to be allocated. And if you yeah. aren't doing that, everything will slip. It's just going to always yeah. slip. I'm a big believer of putting everything in my calendar, everything the to-dos, my calls, everything, workouts, absolutely everything. Because even if you put it in there as a reminder, right, that you get that notification, I just think it's just, it keeps you in check, really, right? And mm -hmm. it keeps you on point in terms of like everything that you do have to juggle in your life. So I'm a huge believer, just put everything, you have to call your dad, your mom, your friend, put it in there as a reminder, you know, yeah. um, because if you do have a very busy schedule, be it you are working for a company or you have your own business, those are the small but important things that slip by really, really easily. So yes, I, I love that, that, uh, that advice. And so to wrap it up, we're going to announce our winner that is going to receive a mentoring session by Greg and so drum roll. I'll have to make like a drum roll thing. <laughs> drum roll. So Laura Whalen, I would love for you to have that mentorship session with Greg. If you are still here and listening, just say hey in the chat um, and I will put my email in there so that we can connect. So Laura, Waylon, if you're still with us, just say hello. Yes, there she is. Okay, so I'm going to quickly put my email in there. So it's robin at moveuplevel.com. Laura, I know it seems as though that it seems as though Laura from her chat that she's got an idea of a mm -hmm. business that she wants to start. And I just figure like, yes, you are the perfect person for this session. So Laura, Email me so I have your contact information and then Greg, I will forward that and put you guys in touch so that you can um, handle that. Um, I think this has just been fantastic. Uh, such great advice. And like I said, it doesn't matter if you work for a company or you are running a business. I just think that all this information is really important to help you feel that you have um, control over your life, that you have a sense of balance, that you feel that you are, you know, managing your business, your family, you know, um, all the important aspects of your life well. So I just love this system that you've created, Greg, and um, I'm happy that we were able to share it with everyone. Thanks. So excited for that. Thanks again, Greg. Thanks again, everyone. You're welcome. Enjoy Thank your you, day. Everyone. Okay. Take care.